Welcome to the Youth Justice Board's Child First Self-Assessment Toolkit launch. In this webinar, we hear from Cordis Bright, who developed the toolkit, and West Yorkshire Violence Reduction Partnership, who piloted the tool and shared feedback which informed its development. The Child First Toolkit is designed to support organisations working with children to see how they might become more child first in their practices and approaches with children. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Youth Justice Board's launch of their Child First Self-Assessment Toolkit. So my name is Jamie Bennett. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Youth Justice Board, um, and it's a pleasure to be able to introduce the webinar today. Um, some a bit of housekeeping as we start. So we um, we've got a quite a lot of people joining today we we ask that you uh keep that you mute your microphone and keep your camera off during the presentations that just uh helps us to make sure that it runs as smoothly as possible with the connections and technology um we are will be recording uh the uh the presentations today uh so that they can be shared and made available later on uh, and um, the presentations themselves and the toolkit will also be published uh, later, hopefully later today on the uh, Youth Justice Board Resource Hub. Uh, we've got um, a couple of presentations today. Uh, first of all, from uh, a recorded presentation from Camco and Sarah Ashworth from Cordis Bright, who we've worked with uh, in developing this toolkit. Uh, and we'll also be hearing from Georgina Watkinson, who work, who's an expert in research and evaluation, who works for the West Yorkshire Violence Reduction Partnership. Um, Georgina has been Georgia Georgia has been involved in piloting the self assessment toolkit in West Yorkshire. So we'll be able to hear from someone who's actually tried this out in practice to hear what the uh, benefits of it are. And we will also be having a Q and A session, so you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, and those uh, the presenters will be able to respond, uh, and that will be facilitated by uh, Dr. Hannah Collier, who's uh, a colleague of mine in the uh, Youth Justice Board. So Hannah is the head of Evidence and Insights, and she's been involved in commissioning and developing this toolkit. Um, questions can be submitted using the Q&A function, which should be at the top of your screen. So um, please just enter your questions and then we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. We often find that there's a bit of commonality between the questions. So we try to make sure that we're responding to the key themes. Um, but with so many people online, it's if people can do it uh, through that method, it just gives everyone a fair chance and it means that we can pick up on the on the things that are most important to everyone who attends. A bit of background to, um, to this. Well, I think, first of all, it's worth saying something about what Child First is and also what Child First is not. So Child First is not an ideology or a set of political beliefs held by the Youth Justice Board or others. What it is, is a framework drawn from decades of national and international evidence about what works in youth justice. And there are four key elements of the Child First framework, um, which we, we set out in a kind of A, B, C, D. So A is as children. So children who come into contact with the youth justice system should be treated as children. The system should recognise that they have particular developmental needs, they're at a particular stage of their life, particular uh, degree of maturity, uh, and have particular needs and vulnerabilities, and that needs to be recognised and their rights respected uh, in the system. The second is the B, that we build on children's strengths. So we know from years of research and evidence that taking a risk-based approach, so saying a child commits a particular offence and you try and fix a fix that particular problem, so for example they're found in 
an example is a found in possession of a knife. So you try and do some kind of knife intervention. Well, we, we know that that isn't actually effective in trying to reduce uh, the likelihood of people committing offences in the future. What does work is that if you take a holistic approach, you think about the wider needs of that child and you build upon their strengths. So if you try to help a child to um, maximise their potential, then one of the outcomes of that is that they're less likely to commit offences again in the future. So that strength-based approach is uh, what the evidence tells us is effective. The third is about communication. So children should be involved in decisions that are made in their individual case. So um, it shouldn't be, the youth justice system shouldn't be something that happens to children. It should be something that they have an involvement in, both in making decisions about their own uh, assessment, their own plan, their own progress, but also in the development of the wider system. So that issue of about children's voice, their engagement, co-production um, are also evidence-based practices. And then the fourth, which is the D, which is about diverting children from the formal youth justice system. So we know from life course studies, studies that follow people from childhood through into adult, often over many decades. We know from this research that children who come into contact with the formal criminal justice system as children are more likely to continue in criminality as adults. So, so, so in some ways, it's the long term, it's counterproductive. So, of course, sometimes it's absolutely necessary because of the um, for public safety reasons or the seriousness of the behaviour of a child that there is criminal justice intervention when they're a child, but that should be used carefully with care uh, and only where absolutely necessary. Where, where it is appropriate and where the opportunity arises, um, other alternatives should be sought for uh, take, identifying the right support and intervention outside of the formal criminal justice system. So using diversion, targeted prevention in order to make sure that children get what they need to grow up successfully and to meet their potential. And this toolkit is, was envisaged as a way of enabling and helping organisations to take action to turn this child first framework into reality in their particular organisation. So the framework, a child first framework, those four critical elements, um, they how they're put into place will vary from organisation to organisation. So this toolkit is intended to help you to introduce child first practices and approaches in your particular organization. It was actually designed not um, primarily for youth offending teams, although of course they can use this and it would be beneficial, but we were also thinking about other organizations that work with children who come into contact with the youth justice system, such as police, prosecutors, health, education, charitable and voluntary sector organisations. So all of those types of organisations could benefit from using this toolkit. Um, and when we were designing it, we um, brought together a number of people from a range of organisations, including those organisations that I've mentioned, to uh, think about how this might be developed and we drew quite a lot on other toolkits that exist to try and help organizations and they take a variety of different approaches so some are very highly formalized with often external assessment processes and accreditation and these usually cost quite a lot of money to administer um, to participate in um, and to operate. So, for example, approaches such as, um, you know, there used to be an accreditation called Investors in People, which was about how uh, how, how you kind of manage people who work for an organisation. And then there's other accreditations such as the Royal College of Psychiatrists do something called Enabling Environments, which takes some of the principles of therapeutic communities and applies it to other organisations. Now, these are very formalised assessments with external accreditation and that cost quite a lot of money to, to, to do. The second approach are, um, are approaches where there is 
some degree of assessment and registration, although at a lower level than those I've described. So an example of this would be the Alzheimer's Society have an accreditation called uh, de dementia friendly organisation. So in order to do this, there is a sort of toolkit where you assess yourself, you come up with an action plan, but you have to register with them to do it and you have to send them your action plan so that they assess it and then it comes back. And again, this is sort of, uh, you know, there's sort of costs attached, significant costs attached to that and it means that some organisations uh, are therefore not able to, to access it. And then the third approach is where it's free to access and free to use, but less formalised. So, for example, we looked at a number of trauma-informed toolkits and also one that I'm aware from my previous work in prisons, which was developed by the International Centre for Prison Studies, which is for humanity in prisons. And these are just these are self-assessment toolkits. So they provide you with the tools, develop an action plan, and uh, you then um, put that in place. So uh, there's no registration, there's no formalisation, it is uh, it's a tool which you can pick up, you can use for your own benefit in order to develop the organisation. And when we spoke to people across the sector, they said that that was the approach that they recommended. They, they said, don't construct barriers with costs and, you know, lots of administration. Give people the tools. There are lots of people out there who are really committed to trying to develop child first approaches just help them to do it, just help them to harness that energy. So that's what we're trying to do with this approach. So we're trying to make this available in order to support you in that quest to develop child first approaches in your organisation. But it does need some commitment. It does need your uh, it does need some your time, your leadership. It needs people to carry out assessments with honesty, to harness support within their organisations and to make a commitment to change. So this is uh, it, it's not a kind of cost free thing. It does take time and energy. But we know that there are people, uh, including yourselves here today, who want to do that. And ultimately, the benefit of this is that the child first, the, the evidence base for a child first approach is that this will lead to better outcomes for children and for communities. So um, that's why this investment is worthwhile. So that's a brief introduction from me. What I'm now going to do is hand over to the, we've got a recording from um, from our colleagues at Cordis Bright, who, which is going to talk in more detail about the toolkit itself. So thank you very much for coming along and hope you enjoy the rest. Welcome to this YJB Child First Toolkit webinar. We would like to start by explaining our roles and contribution to developing the toolkit. My name is Cam Corr and I'm the Product Director in developing the toolkit. Hi, and I'm Sarah Ashworth. I'm the Project Manager in developing the toolkit. By way of background information, Sarah and I work for Cordis Bright, which is a consultancy company providing advice, research and evaluation aimed at improving public services. Sarah and I specialise in providing support to criminal justice agencies due to our previous careers in youth justice, as well as Her Majesty's Inspector of Probation, where we undertook inspections across youth justice and probation services in England and Wales. At Cordis Bright, we have worked on many projects which are sought to develop practice with children in line with the evidence base. At the forefront of our involvement with the many youth justice services we have worked with, has been our recognition that children are very different from adults and as such need tailored support and interventions which recognise this. We were therefore delighted to have been given the opportunity to work with the YJB on this project. Child First is the bringing together of the evidence base about what works to improve outcomes for children who are involved with or at risk of becoming involved with the youth justice system. The toolkit supports the implementation of Child First with the aim of building upon existing good practice with children across sectors. The self-assessment enables organisations to recognise where they may have existing embedded ways of working that already demonstrate a child-first framework and where improvements can, and changes can be made. The toolkit takes an organisation on a journey of reflection to consider how its culture, policies, practices, 
service design and delivery may be actively influenced to support and implement a more child first service. In doing so, an organisation will recognise and own the need for leadership and policies to drive transformational change, which sees child first being rooted and nurtured across all parts of its existence. It is worth highlighting at this point that in developing this toolkit, we have given a lot of thought into the current range of understanding of Child First across all the organisations which work with children or whose work impacts on children. For some, Child First will be a very familiar term and its practices may be ready, re readily recognisable with some services and organisations, whilst for others, this may be a completely new concept to grapple with. We therefore agreed with the YJB that it was important to include relevant background information on Child First and its strong evidence base. As such, the toolkit also includes valuable links and further resources and reading on the subject matter. In this slide, we illustrate the four tenets of the Child First framework, around which the self-assessment tool has shaped its questions. The four tenets of Child First provide a framework for services to consider how they may demonstrate their alignment with Child First in each area. The design of the self-assessment is such that an organisation is encouraged to take the opportunity to reflect upon where it is on its Child First journey and how it can identify next steps against a range of aspects of Child First. The tool has actively avoided a scoring system in undertaking self-assessment, seeking to support the concept of the Child First journey rather than looking to quantify the extent to which an organisation is or is not working in a child first way. It is also important to highlight that there are no requirements for an organisation to report upon its self-assessment findings to the YJB. The tool is designed to be freely available to organisations to support internal review and development. We will now explain the different elements of the toolkit, as this should help in how you approach completing the self-assessment. The toolkit contains a self-assessment tool, which is made up of 25 questions, which are supported by a detailed guidance document. The self-assessment will ask you to consider evidence across the four parts. The first part relates to questions around training. Part two then asks questions across all four tenants. Part three will ask you to reflect on questions as to how well your organisation will evaluate and monitor progress across Child First. Part four will pose questions that you can ask children, thus promoting collaboration with them, giving them a voice and gaining their valuable insights and feedback on how Child First they see the service and where improvements could be made. Part five relates to an action plan for all elements, which we will show you and take you through a little later into this presentation. We will now move on to explaining in a bit more depth how the self-assessment, including the action plan, should work in practice. Here is an example of the questions relating to tenant one for professionals. You can see three questions in the evidence to consider, which will guide you in your responses. The first question asks me what measures your service takes to ensure that children are seen as children and treated differently to adults, i.e. not adultified. You are then asked further questions illustrated by way of questions three and four, which relate to service delivery being informed by child development, and lastly, how the service works to overcome barriers children face. You will need to refer to the guidance document, which is signposted at a hyperlink at the top of each page of questions. This will support you in understanding where evidence could be found to support your answers. Here is an illustration of examples of questions to be posed to children, which also relate to tenant one. The first question is, how well do caseworkers or adults in your service understand what has happened in your life? Secondly, how do adults in your service make sure you understand what is happening or what they are doing? Thirdly, it asks you to consider how welcoming surroundings are when children visit your service. 
As with the questions for professionals, the children's questions are also supported by the guidance document. This last illustration shows how the action plan is displayed in the self-assessment. It is envisaged that by taking your areas for improvement determined by the self-assessment process, a focused action plan detailing actions to be taken, by whom and within what timescales will be developed. Again, the guidance document will support you with this process. The action plan template is a suggested one. You may use, decide to use your own internal templates. You may also wish to use a RAG rating. This is very much discretionary. As mentioned earlier and throughout this presentation, the self-assessment tool is supported by a guidance document. This is an essential part of the toolkit and one which we would encourage you to read and be familiar with before embarking on the self-assessment. It aims to support your organisation in completing the self-assessment in a number of areas. To accurately identify the extent to which it may have already adopted and embedded Char first, where there are areas for improvement, and as just mentioned, you will develop an action plan to address the areas for improvement. The guidance document provides supporting information and a wealth of examples of ways in which an organisation may evidence its commitment to the four tenants of Char first. The guidance points you to further reading and research and aims to encourage curiosity and creativity in paving a way forward to achieve a whole organisational commitment to Child First. This is an illustration of how the guidance document can support you in approaching the Child First framework. This again relates to tenant one. When you are considering the question posed under each tenant, it will be essential to refer to the guidance document. Here you can see that question two, you're asked to consider how your service ensures that children are seen as children and not adultified. You will see useful examples of possible evidence which links directly to the question posed. Here, this one points to training on adult adultification, the use of language, interventions, the physical environment meeting the needs of children and protective measures. A definition of adultification is also provided as a reference. This may be a term that is not familiar to all organisations. We hope that you'll find the toolkit a valuable resource and it will contribute to better outcomes for children as well as safer communities for all. We feel privileged to have been part of the Child First journey and look forward to seeing Child First embedded across the wide range of organisations who work with children and touch upon their lives. If you have any questions, you can reach out to the YJB, their uh, evidence and insights team. You will also be hearing from West Yorkshire Violence Reduction Partnership on their experience of putting the toolkit into practice. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Hannah, I'm head of the Evidence and Insights team at the YJB. Uh, so thanks first of all to Cam and Sarah for their work in developing the toolkit uh, for us here. Um, and a reminder that you can ask any questions in the Q&A function of this uh, meeting or using the Slido that would have been shared with the meeting invitation. Um, so hopefully you now have a better understanding of the tool uh, and what it involves. And we thought it would be quite useful to understand what the tool looks like in practice. So the West Yorkshire Violence Reduction Partner who have piloted the tool for us uh, are here today to explain their experience as well as talk a little bit about the work that they've been doing locally in relation to Child First. So I'll hand over to Georgia Watkinson for that. Thank you. I'll just bring my slides up. Can someone just give me a thumbs up when they've popped up on the screen? 
Oh, lots of thumbs up. Brilliant. Um, so hi, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Georgia Watkinson and I um, am one of the research and evaluation specialists at the West Yorkshire Violence Reduction Partnership. Um, so for those who aren't sort of familiar with violence reduction partnerships, uh, we're one of 20 violence reduction units, partnerships, I think some are called network networks as well, who are funded by the Home Office um, with the task of trying to reduce um, serious violence across the, the UK. Um, so as we said, um, we were very honoured to be able to sort of test the toolkit. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about our experience of testing it, what we found worked well, um, how we're putting it into practice, and also a little bit about the uh, wider work that we're doing in the um, in the VRP around trial first. So completing the toolkit, um, just sort of we decided that the best way to do this was to have an in-person session to complete the toolkit um as a team so whilst i know it's quite time intensive we did block out an entire afternoon to complete the toolkit um which can be tricky with diaries but i would sort of strongly suggest that it is worth doing um we found that this was the best way for us to complete it as a team as it meant it had our undivided attention and we were kind of distracted with emails um so in the room we had the director of the violence reduction partnership who is a seconded police officer. We had our um, senior program delivery manager who heads up the delivery side of our, of our work. Um, we had our head of research analysis and evaluation, our communications and engagement manager, and then a research and evaluation specialist, which was me, um, as I lead on all things child first in the VRP. Um, and we found this worked really well for us because um, it allowed us to get a whole system view of how we apply child first principles in our work rather than sort of looking at it in silos in each of the individual functions. We felt it was really important to have the whole SLT represented, um, including our director, um, because if we're going to implement child first effectively, it really is everybody's responsibility and it's got to be championed at all levels of the team. So this was really beneficial for that. So what worked well, uh, we found that sort of testing the toolkit, it was a really beneficial activity for us. Firstly, it was a really great opportunity for us to reflect on and kind of celebrate our wins and our progress to date. Um, so just for context, we've only really been working on embedding child first principles into the violence reduction partnership for about the last 12 months. Um, and we've achieved an awful lot in a very short space of time. Um, it's very easy, I find, to kind of get lost in the what's next, what, what more do we need to do? Um, so it was really good to have the time to kind of stop, slow down our thinking, and really reflect on what we've already achieved and I've found that that was really good motivation for the rest of the team to kind of keep pushing um, and keep developing the work that we've got on going. Um, we found the questions were really beneficial too. They really sort of broadened our thinking around how child first could be embedded in our work. Um, so for example questions around training which wasn't something that we had initially thought of around child first um, and how staff can contribute, staff's own experience in, from sort of previous roles and personal experience can also contribute to those wider goals around child first. And um, the questions are really well structured and it's kind of a very kind of general kind of journey through through it and it feels very supportive. Um, we found that the um, the toolkit and the self-assessment kind of reinforced our strengths really within the team. Um, so we felt that we were really quite good at our knowledge of, of child development. Uh, we have a, a strong organisational commitment to Child First and uh, we're pretty good at collection and analysis of data um, that promotes the diversionary outcomes for children. Um, and it also highlighted some really good areas of, of improvement for us. Um, so we felt that we wanted to create child friendly versions of our front facing products. That was something that kind of was highlighted. Whilst we might be doing it internally, we're not necessarily reflecting that on our front facing um, platforms. We also noticed some training gaps within the team and um, it also flagged how we could potentially improve how we close the feedback loop when we are sort of working with children, involving them in our work. How can we keep going back to them and making sure they know where we're at with the work and what their contribution has been? Um, and it's also really helped to kind of narrow down what our priorities are going forward, um, which I'll talk a little bit about shortly. Um, with child first there's so much that we can do to implement it was really useful having this self-assessment to really think okay here's what we're good at here's what we're not so good at and these are the most important things for us to focus on going forward so how we want to take this work forward we want to continue to use the self-assessment we don't want it to be a one-time thing that we complete once look at and then sort of park on a shelf we want to regularly refresh this to make sure it stays up to date and um, so we're thinking this will be annually 
we might review that as well, perhaps doing it twice a year, because um, we think this will really help us keep on track of the progress that we're making, but also make sure we're aware of where the gaps are and where we might need a little bit more support. Um, we're going to provide a summary to the whole VRP team um, on what we found our strengths and our areas for improvement are, because as I said previously, sort of embedding child first really is everybody's responsibility. So it's vital that everyone in our team knows our current position and where we need to improve. And then as a team, we're going to collectively identify what our priorities are going to be. Um, so we plan on using a RAG rating system like was suggested in the video um, and then incorporating um, those principles, sort of those priorities into our existing Child First Action Plan and the wider action plan for the Violence Reduction Partnership. Um, and we're going to have each of these priorities as a regular agenda item, sort of at our away days and our meetings, um, so we can problem solve them together as a team. We've got a whole sort of range of, exper of experience and expertise in the team, so it'll be really good to kind of have that collaborative working and ensures it stays a priority for everybody. And we're also going to share the toolkit with our wider partnership. So. Um, sort of our position as Val Introduction Partnership, we work with lots of colleagues across lots of different services. Um, so we really want to share it with them, encourage them to complete it, but also encourage them to share back within the partnership what their strengths are, what their areas for improvement are, so we can all sort of work collaboratively to embed this work across West Yorkshire because there's so much knowledge already out there. We can stop, hopefully prevent kind of work at overlap and repeating work and actually draw on the strengths that we've got in the partnership. So I'm also going to talk to you today a little bit about the work that we do um, around Child First in West Yorkshire. So our ambition is for Child First to be embedded across all services that children come into contact with in West Yorkshire. And this started off as quite a small ambition. This is something that we wanted to achieve within the Violence Reduction Partnership. But uh, we sit in the Mayoral Combined Authority in West Yorkshire um, and sort of this ambition quite quickly grew into being something quite a lot larger. So um, there is now a mayoral manifesto pledge from the recent elections that says to bring a child first lens to tackling all forms of violence within our communities. Um, but ultimately, we want to see this embedded throughout the combined authority because children are impacted by every single decision that we make um, in some way, whether that be sort of immediately or if it's going to be 10, 15, 20 years down the line. Um, so they must be considered and their voices need to be heard. Um, and to do this effectively, we were thinking, you know, how, how can we how can we decide what this looks like in practice? So we thought we need a framework what this, you know, to outline what this is going to look like. And I reckon I know enough about Child First. I've, you know, I know I know a little bit, um, but it was quite clear from the beginning that me and my team were not going to be the right people to write this framework because... Quite simply, in the eyes of children, we're old. And they told us that. I think the best that we got was you guys are young-ish. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely clear that we, we were not the ones to write it. So we thought, who better to ask than the children of West Yorkshire? So with our engagement to create the framework, it has been co-produced with over 450 children from across West Yorkshire. Um, and this is all done through face-to-face -face workshops in a variety of locations. So I've been going out to schools, alternative provisions, youth clubs. Uh, we've done some on football pitches, which the penalty shootout was quite a humbling experience for me. I was not very good, even against some 10 year olds, um, but we'll move on from that. Um, so we knew sort of going into this that there wasn't going to be one approach that was going to work for every single child to speak to. Um, so we wanted to make sure we used a variety of engagement methods. So some sessions that we ran, um, me and my team went out to, to deliver and others, um, we worked with partner organisations for them to deliver on our behalf as they felt that having that kind of trusted adult, someone that their children were very familiar with, was going to get better results. So we were very flexible with how they worked. And to support them because we know everybody is very stretched. We didn't want to create a load of extra work for them. Um, we created a workshop pack that had a number of resources that partners could use um, and sort of did a bit of a suggested session plan to try and make things as easy as possible for anyone that was supporting us with this engagement. So in terms of sort of engagement methods, we had kind of your classic focus group. So we'd go in with flip chart paper, pens, stickers and all kind of be sat on the floor together. Um, we'd sort of be facilitating with some questions and everyone would be kind of writing ideas down or we'd scribe on behalf of the group. 
Um, some of these le um, sessions were led by the children as well, partly because they said my handwriting was rubbish. They just said, give me the pen, we've got this. Um, but they were really fantastic. Sort of, We handed over the list of questions that we wanted to ask and some of the children just, yeah, really took it upon themselves to, to lead the group and collate all the responses. Um, we used mind maps, we did one-to-one -one sessions, um, specifically sort of when children had um, SEND, we'd kind of do this one-on-one -on -one if that's what they felt more comfortable with. Um, I remember we had a few people who said, look, I don't really want to be part of this discussion, but I still want to share my views, I don't really want to talk to you. Um, so they actually drew their responses to some of the questions that we had and then talked us through what each of the pictures meant, which was really lovely. Um, and we even managed a, um, some engagement over a giant game of snakes and ladders, which was fun and quite, uh, yeah, quite interesting, really. Um, so after that engagement stage, which all took place sort of in a three month period, we collected over 16,000 words of feedback for my team to go through. Um, so we conducted a thematic analysis um, to kind of draw out those key themes and see um, what children were telling us from all across West Yorkshire and pull together a draft of the framework. Um, once we had that draft and um, we sent it back out to every single group of children that we had worked with because we wanted to make sure we'd interpreted their views correctly. We didn't want to just guess what they meant and then publish something without checking that we'd actually done them justice because it's completely their work. Um, and we went back to some of the sessions too um, to show them what we'd done and um, talk them through each of the sections and then ask them to pick the quotes that are sort of seen throughout the framework and um, to make sure we had the ones that sort of best represented what their thoughts and feelings were. And we even went to a group who had nothing to do with sort of developing the framework just to test to make sure it was something that represented them too. And thankfully it did. Um, that was a really informative process for us. Um, but just the whole um, engagement process was absolutely invaluable. And both myself on a personal level and the team, we learned so much from every single child that we spoke to. And we really wouldn't have been able to produce something that was as useful as it is um, without all our involvement. So that was fantastic. And then it wouldn't be a presentation on Child First without a little nod to the Child First tenets. So on the screen, the, um, each of the tenets was some of the quotes from the children that we engaged with. So when we're thinking about as children, children told us lots of things that they felt were important for them, for us to consider as professionals when we're working with them. So things like their culture, their family, their sensory needs, um, personality, sense of humour came up a lot, and pets. I think one child told us and thought it was very important that we knew she had 12 cats and a bearded dragon, which was very impressive. Um, and they spoke a lot about setting boundaries and wanting to make sure that whilst they were setting boundaries for themselves but professionals were setting boundaries for them too um, and also that professionals didn't misinterpret their body language and their behaviours um, and that they felt it was really important for them to be seen as an individual rather than people making assumptions about all children after speaking to just a small number so the quotes on there we have professionals should know my story so I don't have to repeat my, my story um, don't make assumptions, get to know me, and then listening to the boundaries I have set and building trust with honesty and kindness. And then thinking about building a pro-social identity, children spoke an awful lot about what makes a good relationship with professionals and how they can help, how we can help to develop one. Um, and they wanted to say on an awful lot of decisions that were going to positively affect their future, such as their education, their communities, climate change, transport, pretty much anything really. And they really valued having the opportunity to share their thoughts and their ideas. Um, but they wanted to see tangible outcomes come out of those conversations. And they also felt there needed to be more opportunities for them to voice their opinions and contribute to decisions. So with the quotes, they've said there's a lack of positive activities for older young people or they are too expensive. There should be more roles like young advisors and roles for young people in schools would be a good idea. And then listening and putting answers together to improve things. And then with collaborating with children, um, this was something that we really thought ran throughout our process. And it was clear that children wanted to be involved in decisions that were going to affect them. And they felt they were able to offer creative solutions and a different perspective that we as adults maybe weren't going to think of. And they wanted to continue to be part of the conversation, even if what they suggested couldn't be put into practice. They understood that, you know, we're not miracle workers. We can't do everything. We don't have an endless pot of money, but they still want to be involved, even if we can't do what they wanted. Um, so the quotes there is explain why and say this is what we can do. What other ideas do you have? Kids have good ideas and solutions, but adults don't listen. And accepting sometimes we know more than professionals. 
And then diverting from stigma, um, the impact of stigma came up an awful lot as children felt that adults often made assumptions about them before getting to know them as individuals. Um, so this included sort of stigma around their past behaviour and sort of contact with the criminal justice system, but also around where they lived, who their family was as well. Um, so the quotes we've got is not think that because I've been in trouble, I'm no good. Don't judge me because I'm from Beeston, which is an area of Leeds for those who aren't sort of local. Um, and don't say I'm like my brother. So, yeah, it was a really kind of powerful experience when we were going through all of the quotes. It was quite hard hitting. Um, and we're really glad that we've kind of got some of those quotes threaded throughout the framework just to really remind us that, you know, it is children's voices behind everything. So our framework aims to outline how Child First can be incorporated at every single level of an organisation. Um, and it's split into five sections and each of those cover a separate theme that was highlighted in our engagement and include some questions to consider. Because um, we know, I think Jamie said it earlier that, you know, Child First and how we implement it is going to look different to every organisation. So we didn't want to create something really rigid that says this is how you do Child First. Um, so we've just included questions that people can sort of ask themselves and reflect on their practice and think, how could we do things a little bit differently? Um, so we wanted to launch our framework. Um, and when we mentioned this to children, they were very clear to us that it must not be boring. And that was their exact words. So we decided to think differently, get a little bit creative. Um, and so we hosted an art exhibition that featured creative pieces and live performances from children about their experiences growing up in West Yorkshire. Um, it was such a fun event. I had a fabulous time. Um, so this was at Sunnybank Mills in Farsley, which some of you might know the sewing bee is filmed there. Um, which it's a fantastic space we're really lucky to be able to get it um and there's some examples in the pictures on screen of some of the work um that was submitted but we had poems we had raps dances collages sculptures and um, even some photography as well i think in total we had over 60 pieces of artwork submitted which we absolutely weren't expecting we were planning for 20 so <laughs> we were absolutely thrilled with the amount that we got in um and what we found was that some children who, when we'd approached sort of their organisation and said, would your children, young people that you work with like to take part in our workshop? We're developing this framework. You know, not all of them did, but we found that the children who didn't want to take part in a more formal workshop were really keen to submit work into the exhibition. So we were able to gain even more perspective and even more insight into children's um, sort of experiences by allowing different mediums for them to express themselves. And this is something that we really hope to continue in the future. Um, and we also got some really positive feedback from professionals as well. Um, I think they found the work that was on display to be really powerful and um, sort of because it was displayed in a different way. It wasn't just, you know, a report that is emailed through to you and you try and squeeze in between meetings. It was, you know, it was a different way of, of communicating, um, which was really, really useful for us. And we also asked everybody who attended to make and decorate with a creative uh, focus a pledge about what they were going to do to incorporate that work going forward. And we did them on little bunting flags, which you can see on the pictures. So they also went up to decorate the venue and we've kept them. And some of them were fantastic, especially from the children. They were obviously the best ones. Um, and then alongside the framework, we're also creating a child first network that's sort of going to bring together like minded professionals and give them the opportunity to kind of learn from each other, share that best practice um, between themselves. Um, and this is supported by our existing multi agency um, child first working group who have been absolutely invaluable in getting this work to this point. So if any any members of the group are on here, shout out to you guys. Um, and our first network meeting is going to be focused um, it's going to take place in September and it's going to be focused on how we make front facing products child friendly and then other themes and topics are going to be chosen by the network. Um, and then we've got lots of plans in the works around child first. Um, I'm going to be very busy, but it's all very exciting. Um, so the next thing that we want to do is co-produce a child friendly version of our framework. Um, because we're conscious that, you know, if children made it, but right now it's not in language that's necessarily child friendly. So we want to make a version that really fits with them. So we're going to work with um, some of the children who co-produced it with us initially to make it child friendly. Um, and we also want to continually engage with children. We're very aware that this framework is not a finished product. It will never be a finished product. Um, so we want to continue to engage with children to make sure it remains up to date and also do some more bespoke work with children who we felt their voices um, could be represented better. Um, 
yeah and then lots of other projects that we're looking at we've got some work hopefully coming up sort of with the police and the criminal justice system and also within the combined authority as well um so yeah lots of exciting things to come um thank you so much for listening to me um i will share the link to the framework in the chat if anyone wants to give that a look um and if anyone wants to chat about um my work sort of in more depth my email's on the screen, but please sort of send through any questions. Um, and finally, I'd just really like to thank the Youth Justice Board for allowing us the opportunity to pilot the toolkit. It was a really great experience for us. And also thank you for letting me come and present today. That's great. Thank you, Georgia. Um, and yeah, huge thanks to yourself and colleagues um at the west yorkshire violence reduction partnership for the time that you took to to really pilot the tool um and provide feedback which has really helped us shape the final version and hopefully make it as useful as possible for everybody um so we will now move on to uh some questions i think they're starting to come through you can look at the q a um space on this Teams meeting and there's also a link from there into the Slido. Um, I think Vicky may also put up the details of the Slido so you can use the QR code or the number at slido.com to get on there and ask some questions. Um, so I will go ahead and start um, taking some of those questions now. So um, first of all this one here are there any good examples of child first being adopted in policing uh, both in principle and in practice i don't know whether georgie you have any local examples or jamie whether there's any you can come up you've come across or, or any other colleagues at, at yjb on the call who might be able to answer that but feel free to jump in if there's anything anyone wants to share in relation to that question yeah so, yeah, so, 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 so. So that, that's a really great question. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so the um, Paul Stride is the staff officer for National Police Chiefs Council um, representing the children's and young people's portfolio. And Paul is a fantastic supporter of um, child first approaches. Uh, um, and uh, so he uh convenes um a quarterly child uh children and young people's forum which brings together uh leads uh, from across the country uh children and young people lead so they share practice so um that is a good place for for sort of hearing about some of the good practice in policing so for example at the most recent meeting there was um an example of some diversionary work being carried out in Kent. Um, the, the other good resources are, for example, the, um, the Children and Young People's Strategy, uh, which is, it, you know, has got lots of kind of good advice about implementing child first approaches in practice. What we've, the, the feedback that we provided to that meeting um, recently has been about looking at which which police areas have really good outcomes in terms of first time entrance so so relatively low numbers of children coming into the youth justice system and trying to understand why that is which is often about having really good diversionary approaches so we we'd sort of say that is the first you know that's the kind of major structural change is if you've got police officers who've got access to right really good whether it's outcome 22 or uh, community resolutions and they're regularly using them that's what makes a really big difference um, there are also examples around the country of uh, training and support that's available um, there are there's some some good work that's been going on about around trying to reduce the number of children coming into police custody um, so Vicky Kemp for example who's an academic at Nottingham has been doing some really great work on trying to support people um forces doing that so there are there are there are some good examples around um i think if you're looking for something specific whether it's you know out of court disposals or um you know the the other stuff that we've looked at at the youth justice board is policing in schools um and diversionary approaches so so we've we've drawn together some advice on that which we can again we can sh we've shared with um, chief police officers and um, police and crime commissioners, but we can also share that 
with people if they if they need it. Um, so we we are we do do lots of work trying to share not just the strategy but also individual examples of practice. But Paul Stride is a, a really great champion within policing for um, for uh, child first approach. So um, as well as the Youth Justice Board, Paul is a fantastic supporter. Great, thank you, Jamie. Um, so looking at some more of the questions, there's one I can answer myself, which is um, whether the tools guidance document includes recommendations on primary research or engagement techniques with children, um, including feedback from successful work running sessions with children, such as those that Georgia described. So we didn't want to duplicate existing resources that are already out there, and there's lots of great stuff that supports this kind of thing. So what we've done within the toolkit is we've referenced uh, some places that you can go to get that sort of guidance. Um, so hopefully Hopefully then combined with the, the excellent high quality guidance that's available out there already, you can use the, the questions that we're proposing in the toolkit to have those conversations with children. Uh, but we do welcome queries and feedback in relation to the toolkit. And if there's something you think is missing that we could include, our contact details are in there. So please do share that feedback with us. And, and when we come to redeveloping the toolkit in the future, we can think about those things in more detail. Um, and now there are a couple of questions that are for yourself Georgia um one is about your email I think you maybe have replied on that already um or somebody else has but we can share your email address um after this um but then one about the child first network that you're running and how that can be joined um and then also around what you've mentioned in terms of supporting partners in completing the self-assessment and developing their action plan and did you have a role in holding them to account in this so if I could pass those over to you Georgia yeah, thank you. So for joining the network, just drop me an email. Um, it's as simple as that and I will add you to the distribution list. Um, and then I think we took quite a similar position to the Youth Justice Board, really, in terms of holding people to account. We didn't want sort of completing the self-assessment and sort of any action plan to feel like extra work. We know that, you know, funding's really tight, resources are really tight. Um, so we didn't want to make anything too onerous. Um, so we've kind of not not held people to account but kind of gently encourage them that it's something they should do and that you know if they do complete and they do share it with us um there's then an offer of support from us as well you know my role is kind of dedicated towards helping partners with child first and helping implement it internally um so yeah there's kind of we kind of hold them to account by offering them benefits and support for doing so rather than saying it's it's a mandatory requirement because I find as soon as you say something's mandatory it kind of switches people off um because everybody's got 101 priorities to be focusing on brilliant thank you so another question is in relation to the challenges with child first and using the child first framework because um of HMPPS guidelines um and the uh priorities there that might not be seen to be compatible so how do you suggest we get around this to make sure outcomes for children are actually at the forefront rather than punitive measures being a priority I don't know if you've got any learning locally Georgia on that or Jamie whether there's anything you'd like to add there I guess locally, so in Leeds, we've recently had a joint targeted area inspection that focused on um, responses to serious youth violence. Um, sort of the VIP were quite heavily involved in that. And what we found was that sort of our commitment to, to child voice and hearing from children and involving them was actually something that was picked up by a lot of inspectors as being really good practice. So I think, I think they can go hand in hand. I mean, I'm not sort of up to date on every single piece of um kind of yeah criteria but I think I don't think they're necessarily competing against each other I think there is a way of doing it hand in hand yeah I think I think that's a really good example of um partnership working and so what you I mean as you as you all well know what you get with youth justice is that there should be a local multi-agency partnership which would involve um, the Youth Justice Service, or Youth Offending Team, the um, the uh, police, prosecutors should be involved, um, probation, health, education. And so the idea is that you develop a bespoke, locally based strategy. Now, the, one of the challenges is to balance those competing priorities and make sure that the um, distinct needs of children are 
are given a voice and the partnership enables enables that to happen but of course that depends very much upon the individuals involved the culture and the history in the local area so we do see variability around the, the country and sometimes this is this is a bit of a battle right but you know i think this is this is this i guess this people involved in youth justice that's they know that they're um often having to fight a battle to make sure that people understand and engage with the, the needs of children and the evidence base around child first and we all have to get our hands dirty a bit in promoting that so the more we can do to convince people that you know there is a, a really strong evidence base that if you want to protect a community and reduce victims then the best thing you can do is a child first approach and the worst thing you can do is a punitive approach because actually long term you'll end up with you know undermining community safety but that, it's often hard for people to accept that message and it takes time and it takes a lot of effort but you know that that's the battle we're all involved in that's brilliant thanks both of you um so i want to draw your attention to one of the comments um in the q a uh asking georgia to let listeners know about the forthcoming article in the special edition of the british journal of community justice which will be published in september so do look out for that um, then there's a practical question about the uh, limit to the size of the organisation who can use the toolkit or undertake the self-assessment. There, there isn't, but it's um, it's available to, for anybody to use and it, it should be flexible enough to use it in whatever way suits you. But I would um, recommend you consider kind of at what level you're able to have influence and make change. And, and it might be most suitable for individual teams, individual departments or whole organisation level, depending on who you are and how you work, how you operate. So do take a look at the guidance and take a look at the tool and um, and work out who you need to bring together to to make those sort of changes. Um, then there are a couple of questions around um, sort of partnerships and so the, the questions ask whether there's guidance for partners in police, health, social care, education um, and what practice can look like in relation to their organisations. And then another one about um, is there a move for being made for schools to take a child first approach? So all of that is exactly what this this tool and the accompanying guidance is, is aiming to do. So um, it, it's exactly for that whole range of partners because we are aiming to reach such a wide range of organisations. It's it's relatively high level, but within the guidance itself, we try to provide examples that um, are suitable and relevant to those different types of partners. So please do share it with your networks, with your partners and encourage them to, to take a look at it and familiarise with it. Um, the, there's also a few points in the Q&A to take a look at around examples. Um, there's some resources that have been shared around the policing question from before um, and uh, highlight that there is some great practice in Plymouth and Surrey, um, which is um, worth finding out more about if you're interested in those examples around policing. Um, there's another question about the toolkit. Is it free? Yes, it's freely available, free to use. Um, you can find it on our resource hub and we'll be providing the details on how to find that um, as well. Um, and just having a look at what else is in the questions. So you mentioned the Frameworks Guidance document includes uh, links to relevant evidence, other plans to compare and collate sources of data and evidence which users of Child First find most useful, or is this something that the Home Office gathers on behalf of violence reduction units? Um, so the, the Youth Justice Board Resource Hub is a great source of information um, in relation to child first practice. So not just the guidance that accompanies the tool, but across the hub is, uh, is somewhere you can find practice guidance in, in a range of areas related to youth justice. Um, so do use that as a port of call for that kind of thing. Uh, Jamie, I don't know if there's anything you want to add in relation to that question at all. That access to resources and information. Yeah, data and evidence that users of Child First find most useful. Yeah, I mean, I mean the the resource. Yeah, the, if the Youth Justice Resource Hub is intended to be a place where you can go and and just get access to that to information which should help you. And if you if you don't find what you need, 
then by all means contact you know on um you can also we can share a link to our um regional oversight managers so our heads of region around the country so again you could contact them in your particular region and they'll be able to signpost you to um other specific resources that may be very specific to your circumstance or your uh, organization so we can provide those individual contacts as well as the general um resource hub brilliant thank you there's a question about whether there's a youth justice forum via linkedin that's not something i would be aware of are there any other forums or groups that we'd recommend um that people could join Anna, sorry, it's me, Steph. I wonder yeah. if there's the WhatsApp group that has been set up. I don't know if Cassie wants just to give a quick update on that. Maybe I put her on the spot. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Cassie. I'm the head of comms at the Youth Justice Board. So we've recently set up a WhatsApp channel um, and we can share the link to that. And the purpose of the WhatsApp channel is to share new effective practice that goes on to the resource hub. So it's meant to be um, a community of, um, of of resources, but it is actually only one way. So there won't be lots of notifications and the normal things that you get on what's, uh, WhatsApp chat. It will just be building up that um, sort of interaction so that you get those alerts into onto your phone but we do also share it via our linkedin channels our twitter and we will be sharing more of it we've got a new, new section on our youth justice bulletin so it will be going out more frequently and we're looking at ways that we can um, amplify a lot of the uh, good practice that we get um, sort of shared with us across a variety of sources for instance through the youth justice plans so we're looking at new ways to do that so i think our channels is probably the best way to to get that information in the quickest way Brilliant. Thank you, Cassie. And the YJB's bulletin is also a, a really great source of information if you're not already signed up to that um, to get our regular updates. I think that covers most of the questions um, that have been asked so far. Is there anything that I'm missing? There, there are a couple of questions on there, Hannah, that which um, if you if you don't mind me just uh, yeah. responding to, which I thought were quite interesting. So um, Malcolm just I mean, quite rightly said that the, you know, the, the Youth Justice Board currently promotes the um, child first evidence base, but that's not always been the case. And, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, I don't know, I guess Malcolm's been around for a while and so, so sort of seen how the youth justice system evolved. And certainly in the early 2000s, um, so the Youth Justice Board was set up in 1998 and then the, the early 2000s saw a significant increase in the number of children coming into the youth justice system and into custody, peaking at around 2005. And, you know, in those days there was a, a view and the YJB was part of that about arguing that intervention through the through the justice system was necessary and that a risk based approach was taken. And, um, you know, absolutely, we, you know, our, our position is that that, you know, that, that we were wrong at that time, you know, the evidence was not right. The evidence then, our understanding of the evidence then evolved um, uh, and our approach has uh, taken account of that evidence. So I think Malcolm's right to highlight the history, but, you know, we would certainly in the last 20 years, um, you know, the Youth Justice Board has been promoting um, approaches which are based on uh, target target prevention, diversion, um, reducing criminal justice intervention, which kind of reflect the child first framework. Um, the the other, another question that was asked earlier on um, was so it's really interesting. One of one of the things that Georgia has talked about, which I think is really interesting, is how Georgia wasn't just about because the Violence Reduction Partnership covers a number of organisations. So Georgia was promoting a child first approach, not just in the the actual partnership organisation, but in members of the partnership. So across organisations. And there was a question about accountability for that. And it was making me think that, 
you know, local youth justice partnerships could, for example, say, we want members to use this toolkit to develop their practice. That would be a way of doing it. And I think, Georgia, you did something similar about encouraging other organisations to practice in alignment with the um, self-assessment toolkit. Yeah, so, yeah, like you say, we have so many organisations and in our multi-agency working group, um, there are kind of the formal members of the Violence Reduction Partnership who are like duty holders, but we've, all, we've also got more informal partners. Um, it's, it's interesting, the question about accountability, because just before this, my director, we were in a meeting and he was going, Georgia, how are you going to hold people accountable to this? Um, but yeah, it, it was actually kind of the suggestion came from the working group we have kind of we very much lean on our partners to to help us drive this work forward because we don't want to add to their workload um but yeah there were there's definitely appetite for this work like when we've been going out and talking about it they're saying i can't believe you know we've not had something like this self-assessment toolkit before and it's really kind of coming at an appropriate time so i think yeah i i do think the kind of more gentle supportive approach is much better than trying to say you must submit this and you must share that feedback because i think there's also a bit of a fear sometimes around doing things wrong and if we're asking people if we're forcing people to kind of send things back you know people are at lots of different stages of their journey like i've spoken to to partners who've said we really want to do this but we don't know where to start and we need your help we've had others that like we've been doing this for 20 years we know exactly what we're doing so actually being able to encourage those to sort of take that leap start working on things and then also kind of buddying them up with people who already know what they're doing have got amazing best practice that they can share i think kind of creates that self really safe kind of learning environment where we we're all supporting each other rather than trying to sort of say who's best and who's not really yeah it's spot on uh spot on i think i think we you know we probably have um you know in the public sector we probably have enough uh measures where we're compelled to do things and that uh, people you know hold us to account for things the, the idea of this tool is that it's it's intended to be supportive and to you know help people uh to develop rather than being a sort of uh, a, a tool to to sort of force people to do things against their will it's intended to help people who want to and go on a child first journey i mean of course if you if you've got an organization that's you know, or, or partnerships that are perhaps performing less effectively, then this can be a tool that can help them on their improvement journey. Um, so I absolutely would agree with Georgia that um, the intention is that this is a supportive tool um, to, to help people on a positive journey to implement evidence-based practice and have a positive impact on children and communities. Brilliant. Thanks both. And I can see we've got one hand up. Elizabeth, would you like to come in with a question? Yeah, hi. It was up from <clears throat> in relation to the previous um, discussion around where we can share information. We've also got Basecamp. I'm not sure if that was discussed, but that's a really good um, place where you do get a lot of emails, but I think it's somewhere where you can go to and fro. We've set up kind of um, helpful forums as a result of that so just an, another way of being able to share kind of best practice as well in addition to the other things that we've mentioned so that was all brilliant thank you okay so i think that it has come to the end of all the questions so i'll hand back over to jamie just to wrap up for the session well thank you very much for all coming along today and for contributing your questions and for showing an interest in the um, in the Child First Self-Assessment Toolkit. Uh, I particularly wanted to thank um, our colleagues at Cordis Bright, who, who gave their presentation to, to Georgia, who, who's given a really fantastic example of uh, putting this into practice and has really given us all a lot of lots to think about and a lot of inspiration as well. So thank you so much. Uh, and, and Hannah, thank you so much for guiding us through the question and answer but also for all of your work in developing this um this project so what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, publishing the toolkit uh, we'll be making that available we in the q a function we put um the link to that information and it will also be 
coming out in the bulletin later today. And if you want to sign up to the bulletin, um, if you just search for YJ Bulletin, the details of how to sign up for that will will come up. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, and we we hope that this tool will will be helpful to you. And um, you know, I think the people who've come along today are people who are committed to making a positive difference in their organisations, in the lives of children, and in their communities. And this self-assessment toolkit is something which we believe can help you on that journey. And we'd love to hear from you. So um, if you want any sort of help, advice or support, of course, get in touch with us. I did put up in the Q&A the heads of oversight for our particular, for the regions around the country. But of course, come to myself, Hannah, anyone else in the YJB, and we'll get you to the people who can provide you with the support that you need. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you about how you've used this toolkit, because we hope that you will use it in your organisations and in your own journey to making that positive difference. So thank you very much for coming along today. Uh, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you.